One thing I wanted to touch upon was your uh, Power BI course. So you mentioned it. Um, and I know I was looking over your Power BI course and I know you, you're a fan of these like uh, very like just fun and kind of engaging projects. I know you have like a Bigfoot and a UFO sighting to yeah. two of those projects there. Now, unless you've been under a rock in the U.S. at least, in the U.S., there's a big buzz around UFOs, especially with the government and all that. Yeah. So I have to ask you, or, or can, you, can you read the future? What's going on there? Should we expect Bigfoot in, in, in the news? In a couple of months, or <laughs> I sure hope I can read the future. I'll, maybe I should try my hand at the stock market. Um, but uh, I, I think I got, got I mostly got lucky on that one. But uh, <laughs> I, I'll, I'll say this: I, I hope so. I, it, it would just make life a lot more interesting, you know, if yeah. there were actual aliens in Bigfoot, like and more yeah. more data to collect too on on both fronts. Um, just you know, <laughs> add add some add some spice and interest to life. I personally am not worried about aliens i figure you know if they're here if they traveled you know thousands of light years to get here if they wanted to mess with us they could so if they're already here they're probably nice enough and, yeah. you know bigfoot just kind of wants to be left alone i think you know if he's out there so i'm not i'm not terribly worried about either uh, but it uh but yeah I, it's it's like they used to say in the x-files i want to believe i'm not sure if i do but i want to believe i want to believe I yep. like that. I like that. Who among us hasn't allowed their thoughts to venture into the realm of UFOs, extraterrestrial beings, and Bigfoot? Surely Travis and I are not the only ones, right? Whether it's merely fantasy or reality, one thing is undeniable. Travis sure knows how to turn data into an adventure, only selecting the most intriguing data sets for us to work with and learn from. And his Power BI course is not only comprehensive, but it actually makes learning fun. But let me not beat around the bush here. My sit down with ZTM instructor and experienced data analyst Travis Kuzik was truly a jam packed one. This conversation is a treasure chest of insights for all you aspiring data analysts out there, so make sure to stick around until the end. As always, feel free to check the timestamps below to see everything we've covered. One more thing show us some love. If you want to see more insider secrets from professionals in tech, make sure to drop this video a like and leave a comment. All right, that's it for me, and I hope you enjoyed this conversation with the fantastic Mr. Travis Kuzik. What is going on, guys? I am here with Travis, and uh, honestly, man, before anything else, I appreciate you taking the time to, uh, to, to join us here. I know a lot of people are excited. Um, you're one of the better reviewed. All of our instructors are great, but you're one of the higher reviewed instructors we have, so I was very excited to get you on the podcast. Uh, but before anything else, uh, introduce yourself and kind of let us know your background and what you do. Well, my name is Travis Cusick. I'm a, a business intelligence and analytics consultant. Uh, currently, I work independently. So I do a mixture of short and long-term contracts for various companies working on various types of roles within that business intelligence analytics spectrum. And I also do some work consulting and training with smaller companies. So when I work with larger companies, it's it's more likely as a smaller role on a very large kind of technical project. Mm -hmm. For smaller companies, it may be more along the lines of kind of building a complete system for a relatively small shop and also training people how to use it or even empowering people to kind of create their own small scale systems. Uh, I also like to do any kind of individual training and coaching that I, that I can. I, that's something I kind of squeeze in there from time to time. And of course, I, I'm an instructor at ZTM, which is it's my favorite role. I, I, I love being an, uh, being an instructor. And even in, my, even in my consulting work, I try to make what I do about, about being a good communicator, about being able to explain and break down the things that I'm doing. Uh, as my background, I've been doing this kind of work for longer than I'd care to admit. Um, don't want to show my age here. Let's say 10 years and leave it at that. Uh, <laughs> a little bit longer than that. Um, I've been around for various types of companies, largely in, in the finance sector, although telecom is another is another sector of the economy that I've, I've done analytics work for. Um, got my start as a completely non-technical person. I came from a, a warehousing operations background. I worked at, at Amazon.com as a trainer. And then kind of talked my way into an analyst job for a telecom company and learned, uh, picked up Excel 
to kind of, you know, distinguish myself from other people who know more about the business and kind of fell in love with data. And it, it, that's, that's been my, my working life ever since. Dude, that's lovely. That's, uh, that's, like you said, it's a, it's been a long career. Now, I, I am curious on, you said you've worked with large scale companies and smaller scale companies. If you were to like break it down in a percentage, um, as in like, do you work mostly with smaller companies or mostly with larger companies? Um, most, most, mostly, with, mostly with larger companies. And, and when I work for larger companies, it's almost always on a contract basis. So I'll, I'll do, yeah, it might be a three month contract. It might be a six month contract. Um, and, and during those times, i that's pretty much what I'm doing other than, you know, working on coursework as, as sort of my, my side gig mm. or maybe doing some kind of individualized coaching and training here and there. And, but I, I like working with and for small companies because there's more of a, I have more control over the solutions that I build. You know, typically if it's say some local financial advisory firm that, is just trying to make sense of their data in a con in a consolidated way. They don't need a huge team. They really just need me to go in there and and teach them how to build something themselves, which for me is more fulfilling than being what they call hands on a keyboard, where somebody mm -hmm. just kind of tells you what they want. You type out the code, you build it, you leave. I, I I prefer empowering people to be able to kind of build their own stuff, or at the very least, maintain the thing that I built and even enhance it in the future as needed. Oh, that's great. So you mentioned you mentioned that um you kind of transitioned from Amazon and that was the start. But what was the like what was the motivation? What was your like what was going through your head when you were like, okay, I want to transition to this? What sparked that interest in this field in the like in the first place? Well, um, back then if you can kind of go back in time and try to remember those thoughts. Well, yes, and all the way back in time. Uh <laughs> again, further than I'd like to admit, but at the time I, I knew that I, I, w I thought I was a very logical thinker mm -hmm. and I was good at math. I always liked math, but yeah. I was terrified by technology, ironically, terrified by ex spreadsheets. At, at my, my job at Amazon, every now and again, you'd have to do some small thing with Excel. And I barely even knew how to open it. Like it, it, to, to give you an example of this in high, and this this should be hopefully inspirational to anybody out there who who thinks, "Gosh, I'm not a technical person. I can't break into this." Well, we'll check this story out. It, in high school, <laughs> I, again, I was I was good at math, um, but I, I took a computer applications class, which mm -hmm. in retrospect was very simple, and there was plenty of students in this class who who weren't generally good students. Who, who, who were just running laps around me. Like it was right before lunch and I would always be the last person in there every day struggling to finish typing whatever assignment that I had, you know, hunting and pecking around with one finger on the keyboard. And I remember the first day, I didn't know that you had to turn on the computer with a separate box. I thought the monitor was the computer. I thought it was like a TV. You just hit the button on the monitor. So I kept hitting yeah. the button on the monitor thinking it was going to come on. No. So... <laughs> All that I'm I'm going around the world to get back to this thing of me being this kind of this non-technical person at Amazon, terrified of computers, intimidated by spreadsheets. But I thought being an analyst would be fun because you you get to you get to kind of be a critical thinker. You get to um, mm. explain things, explain technical things to a non-technical audience, which I really enjoyed at Amazon. So I applied for an analyst job, and uh, I remember the. The week before I applied, I bought a book on Excel and I just kind of worked through a bunch of problems trying to like figure out how to use spreadsheets, the library. And with a book and a prayer, I, I, I made it through the interview, got that job. But again, my my in, my intention was not, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm such a technical guy. I can't wait to do this. I really didn't. I really didn't know what I was getting myself into. I kind of discovered how much I liked the technical aspect of the job after starting it. Uh, yeah. Everybody else. Okay. Yeah. So everybody else who worked there was kind of a domain expert. They all knew the business side of things really well. And I, I had no background in, in telecom whatsoever, but I thought, okay, we use Excel a lot. Let me see if I can become an expert at Excel. And that will kind of make me stand out. And I just found, I just love playing with data. It was like magic. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's one thing if you've never really worked with, if you've worked with spreadsheets a long time, but if you haven't, 
the idea that you can punch a bunch of numbers in over here and then write a formula over here and then it takes those numbers and produces some interesting result and then you can format it and then you can even start writing VBA and like, here's me, non-technical guy, writing actual code. I was <laughs> kind of in love with it and that's and I said, you know what, this I want this to be my career. It's something that you know I, I had an aptitude for that I didn't really know that I had um, and it was really interesting and, and, and fun. And obviously, it's it's also a career path that's pretty lucrative. Uh, there's a, there's demand for yeah. it. So yeah, I, I I kind of I I will admit I I sort of fell into it, but like once I realized that I liked it, I I ran you stuck on it. it. Yeah, yep. it's really inspiring to hear that. I feel like a lot of people nowadays um, have to have this certainty of oh, before I start this, I have to be like fully passionate about it. I have to just. Like that, there has to be like a, almost like a burning desire to want to learn this stuff. And sometimes, I mean, that's not a bad thing to have that. But yeah. sometimes it's okay to just experiment, and you end up liking it a lot. That's kind of what happened with me with uh, when I first started playing around with cameras. I didn't think it was I was really gonna like it, and then I ended up loving photography and all that stuff. So it's really cool to hear that. I think it gives people like a different perspective, you know? Yep. You don't know what you don't know. You, there's so much. You, you think, you know, when you're 22 years old, you think you know everything about everything. You know you know exactly what you want to do, exactly who you are. But there's it's such a wide world out there. You, you don't know all the things that you can do that you might love that you just haven't tried yet. Exactly. Exactly. Now, this next question I want to ask you might sound like a bit of a newbie question. I am a noob when it comes to this uh, kind of stuff. So we're all new, relatively the- speaking. <laughs> I appreciate that. I hear two terms always kind of mixed together, um, and those are a business intelligence analyst and a data analyst. Are they the same thing? Are they? Can they be used interchangeably? Can you, if, if they're not, can you tell me the differences uh, between them? And maybe for someone that's interested in and in keep interested in this field and keeps hearing these kind of terms, uh, can, kind of just break that down for us, you know? Sure. So if there were a Venn diagram where you, you maybe this is business intelligence and this is uh, data analyst. It's probably like this. It's probably like 80. I don't know if that's 80%. Maybe an 80 Almost there. Overlap. Almost fully. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It's somewhere along those lines. So one thing I, I, I say, and I've learned having worked at big companies for a while, not to get too hung up on titles because titles often, especially within a company, don't make sense. And even or, or, or the meanings are just not, broadly understood to be the same thing you know data analyst might mean a different thing to a lot of different people so when i so when i'm about to say as far as what i think the meaning is may not be what every company's meaning of that of that career path is a company may be hiring for a data analyst and their idea what they think of that role being may be very different than what i'm about to say but so what i'm going to try to do is sort of aggregate all the different definitions and uses I've seen of these terms over the years to kind of get you a rough average of the two. Mm -hmm. So I would say that business intelligence analysts typically focus more on what is called descriptive analytics, which basically means you're describing what happened in the past. Now, data analysts do a lot of this too, but BI analysts tend to, that tends to be kind of, that's their domain. They're not doing like forecasting typically. They're not doing more advanced statistical stuff like hypothesis testing or A-B testing. Their focus is on studying what happened, why things happened the way that, the way that they did, and then presenting those findings in a really attractive, dynamic way. So your, your BI analyst is going to focus a lot on reports, dashboards, maybe decks if you're very unlucky. I'm not a big <laughs> fan of PowerPoint, but like a PowerPoint will occasionally be a part of your life typically as a bi analyst just something you got to deal with um and you'll also be heavily involved on the data side like taking raw data from a database transforming it into something that you can actually put into a report now Mm -hmm. data analysts do a lot of that stuff too but they're probably a little less emphasizing the the reporting side of things like be a, a uh Professional BI tools like Power BI or Tableau are probably more commonly used by BI analysts versus Mm -hmm. data analysts. And data analysts probably also don't typically get as involved in the hardcore ETL stuff where they're playing with source data to try to transform it into something usable. They're more about the part of the BI job that is just take the data, turn it into something actionable, but sprinkle on some stats. 
Uh, there's gotcha. definitely not always. You, I, I've mm -hmm. seen plenty of data analyst jobs that pretty much just involve fetching data data from a database with a, with SQL, dropping it into Excel, putting a pivot table on it, and that's it. But you're you're also reasonably likely to find data analyst jobs that ask for some kind of statistics. It may just be basic descriptive statistics, but it may involve a little bit of like regression analysis where you can kind of look at these factors and not just say this is what happened, but you can say, well, here's how these two variables affected each other. Um, things like, again, A-B testing and hypothesis testing, which BI analysts typically don't get into. So I would say mostly the same, mostly focused on descriptive analytic, uh, descriptive data analysis for both, but the data analysts typically have a little more stats and your BI analysts typically have more of an emphasis on dashboards, decks, and kind of hardcore data engineering type stuff. Well, that makes sense. That makes sense. So if if I understood this right, is it like, let's say if you're a, if you primarily been a BI analyst and you want to transition to purely just data and analytics or that, um, that's, that's not a very hard transition because like you said, it's mostly interchangeable what you're, uh, there are some differences, but most of the time you're still kind of doing similar tasks and stuff like that, correct? Absolutely. I mean, I've I've literally been in the same role and had mm -hmm. my title at the company change from business intelligence analyst to data analyst when I was doing the exact same thing, which just to give you an idea about how arbitrary titles can be at companies, I've been a business systems analyst, a business ops analyst. Uh, oh, wow. There's know, a lot of titles. Tons of titles. Titles out the wazoo. And sometimes there's Roman numerals at the end of them. I've been a business analyst four, a business systems analyst three, and I have no idea what any of them really meant. It's just <laughs> the work is the work. You know, you're an analyst, basically. Yeah. You, you, you play with data and numbers, and, and then there's just an emphasis on certain elements of the workflow versus others, depending on what on, on what role you find yourself in. Oh, makes sense. Makes sense. Now, the next thing I wanted to ask you was earlier, you mentioned, uh, obviously, for the people that don't know, Travis makes courses here on data analysts, BI analysts, and this kind of stuff um, here at ZTM. But the the question I really want was curious about is, uh, how did you get started with with ZTM? What was your introduction, and how did out how did that all work out at the beginning? Well, ironically enough, my introduction was actually not as an instructor, but as a student. Uh, really? Work yes, I was working oh, as wow. a um, not on the the platform, but on on one of Z I took one of ZTM's Udemy courses on React because I was working on a project where the reporting tool used React, and I wanted to learn more about how React works. So I obviously, the ZTM course was very highly rated, so I, I bought that. And I was like, wow, this is, this is the production values were great. The, much more important than that, though, the, the, the instruction was great. So that was, that was kind of my introduction to ZTM. And then I had created uh, some courses of my own um, on SQL and then one on, one on Excel. And uh, Scott from ZTM reached out and said, hey, you know, would you be interested in kind of being a part of our platform? And I already, I had already taken a ZTM course, so I had a very high opinion of ZTM as from a student's perspective. So I said, heck yeah, you know, I, I would, there, I had, I had had other people reach out and say, hey, would you like to create courses for our platform? And then I would kind of look at the platform and say, mm, thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> but I had already kind of seen what ZTM had to offer, so I said sure and i have not had a single regret since that's amazing that's amazing shout out yihua as well for the the mm -hmm. instructor that makes the react course he's a great instructor fantastic uh, work, fantastic instructor yeah i agree i took that course as well and i i loved it um now let's talk about your courses so you have four courses out correct yes what are the differences between them unlike a high level it doesn't have to be too in depth yeah. but the high level differences between them for someone that doesn't know anything about data solutions and okay. kind of also like a, I guess like a tangent to that is after like you explain the differences for someone that is looking to get into data solutions, is there a particular order that you would structure the courses in to take them? Sure. So I'll actually just kind of present them, I guess, in the order that I would, I would recommend, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Right. So the start, the, the starter is, is definitely the Excel bootcamp. And this is a, a foundational introduction to Excel. This assumes zero knowledge up front. You don't really have to know anything other than just can, can you, you know, do you have a computer? Can you operate your computer? 
And it mm-hmm. taking from from that level to well, pretty much where I was. I actually taught this course with my former very non-technical self in mind. Like if I had to teach this guy, this guy who doesn't even know how to turn a computer on, how to be good at Excel, this was the course I had in mind. Now, if with that said, if you already are decent with Excel, and it goes pretty quickly, like you're not, you, you'll, you'll still be challenged pretty quickly, but I don't really assume any intermediate knowledge. And it, it takes you from, again, no knowledge of spreadsheets to pretty advanced stuff. Like what I would consider the fundamentals that anybody, any Excel user, power user really needs to know from pivot tables to formulas, charts, and all that. And it, it doesn't assume any advanced versions of Excel. You don't have to have the most recent version. So it's kind of your, your foundational course. Mm-hmm. Then the next course I'd recommend is the Excel for Business Intelligence course, which introduces this newer suite of kind of add-ons that Microsoft has incorporated into Excel specifically for business intelligence applications. So these are really kind of surprisingly industrial strength tools that are just baked in to any version of Excel, I think 2016 or later, uh, mm-hmm. which is kind of incredible. Like they're, they're tools that are specifically designed to be able to handle millions of rows of data in Excel and kind of do like high industrial strength reporting applications in a, in a spreadsheet. Wow. After that, I would recommend Power BI. So Power, I said earlier, if you're, especially if you're on the business intelligence side of things, you're probably going to be expected to create a very high fidelity executive dashboards. And that's what a tool like Power BI is for. It's kind of like Excel, if Excel were optimized for that specific purpose. But the cool thing is, if you've taken the Excel for BI course, Power BI is just going to click because a lot of the underlying technology is the same. Even the, the formula language that you use to analyze data is the same between the two. So mm-hmm. all the stuff you, you, you learned in Excel for BI, you'll kind of perfect when you learn Power BI. Then the fourth course is VBA. And, and you could look at this as optional. You could very easily be a data analyst or a, or a BI analyst and, not go your, and, and go your whole career and not have to write VBA. But I'll say VBA is is, is knowing VBA, which is uh, again for for kind of newer for people who haven't heard of it, is a programming language you can use to automate Excel and other office applications. If you know VBA, you can kind of become the person around the office who knows how to automate these boring, redundant processes that nobody else does. So it's a great way to stand out. It's mm-hmm. a great way to kind of be a almost an entrepreneur within your department, the person mm-hmm. who identifies some process that could be automated and using a, 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 a technology that's already in your on your machine, already installed in Excel that you don't have to ask permission from IT to get, you can develop some solution that's going to save everybody tons of time. And that sort of thing can definitely get you noticed. And, and the other great thing about learning VBA is that it's a great way to learn to code because the way Excel, well, the way VBA interacts with Excel is that you can actually have Excel write the code for you uh, using something called a macro recorder where you perform actions in the spreadsheet and mm-hmm. Excel writes the VBA code that describes those actions. So you can kind of teach yourself to code in an intuitive way. You can have it generate code for you and then go in and kind of modify and edit that code. And before you know it, like on day one, you're writing programs, which is... Wow. Something that's, and not just like hello world, but actual like useful problem solving programs, which is kind of difficult to pull off in like any other language. So it's, I think it's a fantastic way to kind of have a jumping off point into, you know, Python or whatever other kind of of data processing language you want to use. Oh, that makes sense. I I was actually very proud when I did my first hello world, like first or second day of coding. It's funny. It's it's magical though. It's like that first formula in Excel. If you, if you haven't done it, it's like, wow, I did that. My God, my goodness. I typed in this little thing over here and then this thing (laughs) happens over here. Crazy. Yeah. No, I think that uh, once new developers or new um, analysts that that once they experiment, people that are getting into tech and they experiment and see that for the first time, it's a big, like rewarding thing. Um, So would you say that, uh, VBA programming is kind of like a, a big resume standout in a sense, right? For someone that's 
like uh, maybe trying to get into it, into the field, having BBA is a plus. Absolutely. I would say it's, it, it is something that distinguishes you as mm -hmm. somebody who kind of brings maybe a slightly more unusual skill, skill to the table. Every, I mean, mm -hmm. if you're going into BI, everybody has SQL. You have to have SQL. Yeah. So the, you, that is, you're not going to make your resume pop by having SQL on it. But by having BBA, you say, oh, well, I, I know like an actual, I guess you'd say a Turing complete programming language, like a, a programming language that can kind of do whatever I want it to do. And and I'm somebody who can automate things around the office. So, so yeah, I do think it's something that will make your resume stand out. Now, it's not, there's probably not, I won't say there's not such a thing as, a, as like a VBA career because there are consultants who make their living pretty much just building VBA based solutions. But typically it's more of a, a career amplifier than it is like, I'll get a job with VBA. It's more like I can get freelance gigs with VBA. There's, there's quite a few of those, but I can also just make myself a stronger candidate by knowing VBA and having this kind of extra tool in my tool belt. Yeah, which is a, a huge benefit, just trying to stand out from, because tech is huge now. People are, oh, I feel like every day people are trying to migrate into some kind of tech, like yep. work in tech. Um, so that's huge. One thing I wanted to touch upon was your uh, Power BI course. So you mentioned it. Um, and I know I was looking over your Power BI course, and I know you, you're a fan of these like uh, very like just fun and kind of engaging projects. I know you have like a Bigfoot and a UFO sighting to yeah. two of those projects there. Now, Unless you've been under a rock in the U.S., at least in the U.S., there's a big buzz around UFOs, especially with the government and all that. Yeah. So I have to ask you, or, or can, you, can you read the future? What's going on there? Should we expect Bigfoot in, in, in the news in a couple of months? Or <laughs> I sure hope I can read the future. I, maybe I should try my hand at the stock market. Um, but uh, I, I think I, got, I got, mostly got lucky on that one. But uh, <laughs> I, I'll, I'll say this. I, I hope so. I, it, it would just make life a lot more interesting, you know, if yeah. there were actual aliens in Bigfoot, like, and more, yeah. more data to collect too on, on both fronts. Um, just, you know, <laughs> add, add some, add some spice and interest to life. I personally am not worried about aliens. I figure, you know, if they're here, if they traveled, you know, thousands of light years to get here, if they wanted to mess with us, they could. So if they're already here, they're probably nice enough. Yeah. You know, Bigfoot just kind of wants to be left alone, I think, you know, if he's out there. So I'm not, I'm not terribly worried about either, uh, but it, uh, but yeah, I, it's, it's like they used to say on the X-Files, I want to believe. I'm not sure if I do, but I want to believe. I want to believe. I yeah. like that. I like that. Um, now on, on your courses in general, but by, by the way, I've actually, before I get to that question, is there kind of touching upon what I just asked was, is, is that like something you always keep in mind, keeping those projects that you make, like with fun data because i feel like if you're if you're looking at or someone that's trying to learn this stuff if you're looking at fema i don't know what maybe what the most boring data would be but if you're looking at like really just kind of dull data that wouldn't be as engaging so do you always try to keep that in mind when you're making um big projects in your courses absolutely um not not every data set can be you know quite as fun as bigfoot sightings that's yeah, that yeah. Was probably i don't know i can't think of anything much more fun than that but i try to have a nice mixture of practical data sets that are really realistic and fun data sets and ideally a little bit of both mixed in yeah but just from my experience as somebody who's who, who taught myself most of the stuff that i you know years ago that I'm, I'm now teaching back i always found it much more engaging to work with any any text that had any kind of sense of humor at all it just sometimes the material you know can be a little bit dry I mean, it's very technical you're dealing with programming languages and how to how to create relationships between tables mm -hmm. and if there's no sense of fun or humor about it, it it can be harder to just maintain your focus but those little moments of levity can kind of almost give your mind a little break and almost like a little reset within the learning process and then you can just keep going versus just oh i've been watching this for 20 minutes i'm done <laughs> you know that makes sense that makes sense well, like I mentioned before, um, you have great, uh, like people have le left really good reviews on your courses. So it kind of leads me to my next question. Are you planning on on uh, making any new courses in the future? Do you have any kind of things in mind, anything in the pipeline? Can you touch upon that for us? Yeah, so there there is one in the pipeline. It, it is under development. I'm working on a, a Python for automation course. Oh, so this is as the same. Very cool. Yeah, so this it'll it'll kind of be like multiple courses in one because 
it, it, it's it's going to be structured in a modular way where each section of the course kind of pertains to some thing you can automate with Python. So it's it's not targeted towards you know senior engineers who want to improve kind of their software engineering capabilities. You know, there's no test driven development. It's all about solving kind of practical everyday problems with Python, including, for one example, um, this is actually the section I'm working on now, automating Excel. So I'm, I'm oh. really excited about it. It's it's going to be, you know, you can take the first part of the course and then after that, you can say, well, I want to learn how to, you know, send emails with Python or I want to learn how to do web scraping with Python. And you can just kind of dip into any of these sections that kind of capture your interest. So that's, that's currently uh, under development. Um, and then I do have, I have some ideas for next year, you know, oh. so they're, they're, they're kind of, they're kind of fuzzy. They're kind of cloudy. They need to coalesce a little bit, but, uh, kind of around using Excel as a, as a more, as a, as a tool for more statistical analysis. Some of that more data analyst type stuff we talked about earlier. That's, uh, though that's more in the, in the conceptual phase right now, but the, the more immediate thing is, is Python for automation. Python for automation is a for sure, right? That's coming. That's coming. That's great to hear, man. That sounds like an exciting course. I'm excited um, to be working on it, yeah. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm excited to see that. Uh, one, so earlier when we, first, when we first started talking, you said that before you made the switch, you were really good at math. Now, hopefully um, hopefully your answer is, is what I expect, but um, with, with, this, with this area that you're in, what happens if those, these people that maybe want to get into this field but just don't have that high-level math skills? How much is, is math involved in this field? And, and let's say if, if, if you didn't do good in math when you were in high school or something like that, does that mean that this probably isn't the right choice for you? There is surprisingly little math involved in in and the analytics field uh i i honestly expected more but mm. you i would say that the only type of math you'll see on a regular basis is statistics and even okay. then it's going to be generally kind of basic descriptive statistics like if you know like standard deviations for example if you can just explain basic statistics like the average versus the median and the standard deviation you're fine like for for most jobs um, especially on the business intelligence side. The only place, I mean, I hate to, to say that I, I wasted, you know, years of taking math, but a little, um, you know, like calculus and linear algebra and such are, are, are really not going to help you at all other than, I guess, maybe it helps you think logically or something. But I, I some of my best coworkers who were the best analysts are, by, by their own description, hated math. So it really, I don't think there's much correlation other than probably people who like math tend to be drawn to more technical things, but not necessary at all. I would just say, educate yourself about just basic descriptive statistics, not like reading a textbook. Um, you know, you don't need to understand all those arcane terms that, that, you know, you, you probably had to learn in stats class. It's more about understanding data and the relationships between pieces of interconnected data and, and, and understanding what people need to see on, you know, on their reports. It's, it's, I would say, surprisingly, if you had, to, if you asked what's more important to a business intelligence analyst, mathematical ability or communication skills, it would be communication skills and it wouldn't even be particularly close. Um, wow. Not particularly close at all. Somebody who's a math genius but is not good with people and is not good at communicating findings and explaining things will not be a good business intelligence or data analyst. Wow, that, that, that's fantastic to hear because I feel like um, communication skills is obviously something that even if you don't have great communication skills, it's easier to develop than high-level mathematics skills. Like yep. that's just, it, it's hard for some people. You know, I'm, I'm not the greatest at math, so I can kind of relate. That's amazing to hear. Now, you said that uh, you work for a couple different um, or in general, in the past few years, you've worked for bigger and smaller companies. What does a typical day to day look like? Doesn't have to be too in depth, but a typical day to day look like for both kind of perspectives. For a bigger company that you're maybe on a contract with, and a smaller company, um, what are the, those key differences? Bigger company is is definitely going to involve a lot more meetings. Big, bigger companies just, and this I think there's almost a, a one to one proportion of like meetings to the size of the company uh co large companies are just they're just in love with meetings you're going to be in a lot of meetings like you, you may think 
gosh, I, I want to go into a technical field so I can just kind of sit in the corner and write code all day. Uh, but biz, BI analysts and data analysts are very much connected to the people who consume that data. They need to be. They need to understand what people are really trying, the insights people are trying to get out of the data. So they, they're really connected to stakeholders, but they're also really connected to, or they need to be connected to the people who are using the systems that are producing the data to begin with. So you will be on lots, if, if you're working for a bigger company, you'll be on calls with stakeholders, you'll be on calls with people in the business who are helping you understand how the system works and problems they're having with the system that may lead to data quality issues. Uh, and, and then you'll be on meetings with your team where you're deciding who's going to do what. And then finally, you might get your like one or two hours where you sort of get to retreat to your cubicle and actually write. <laughs> my, my thing there is, okay, I'm going to be in six hours of meetings today, but those other two hours need to be, are, are just sacred. You know, I need to get into my flow state, like put the headphones on, send that signal that like, do not disturb, you know, <laughs> I am in technical mode now because you, you, you're not guaranteed to get a lot of that time. Mm -hmm. For a smaller company, the communication, you may be, com you know, interacting with people just as much, but I would say it's higher quality communication. You're, you're more talking with one person at a time or two or three people at a time. And most likely the people that you're talking to are both the stakeholders and the system users kind of all in one. So the communication is just more efficient. It's more, it's more enjoyable in general uh, because you have greater control o over it. But obviously the downside is the, those gigs are not quite as easy to get sy systematically as, you know, large companies are always posting three to six month contracts. So th those are kind of easier to get and reliable. You know, you've got a job for three to six months. So it's a trade off. But, and then, but I would say, again, your larger company is going to be probably 60% meetings of various kinds, 20 to 40% actual coding work for smaller companies more just kind of interacting with individuals and a lot of training and coaching. Again, given that there's, I'm dealing with a smaller group of people who can't afford their own like in-house IT team or in-house business intelligence team, the focus is more on kind of educating and training, which is what I like to do best anyway. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's, I would say the big difference between those two. Okay. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I was going to, I had a question I was going to follow up with, but it seems like, I think I know the answer to it already because I've heard like this, um, this idea that some people believe maybe before getting into this field that when you work as a data analyst, you're kind of like, um, you don't interact with many people. You're kind of like a lone, kind of like a lone wolf scenario. But mm -hmm. it seems like you do have a lot of interactions throughout the day. Um, is is what yeah. would you say about that? Uh, yes, you 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 can try to be a lone wolf, but you, you you probably won't be able to remain. Like you will find an entourage following you, whether you want them to you, them to or not. <laughs> uh, you you can you 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 can try, uh, but yeah, there's you, you will be having interactions in, in multiple different dimensions, regardless yeah. of whether you're working for a, a large company or a small company. But being a, a BI analyst is a, is is kind of a social gig. Um, yeah. Now. It's not not oppressively so. Like I'm an introverted person. I'm I'm not like it's not like I have to go to you know networking parties and schmooze with people. But mm -hmm. you you have to be okay. You have to be reasonably good at at explaining things to people, at asking the right questions to people to get the information that you need. You're kind of like in the middle of a switchboard where you're getting information from this person over here, and then you're kind of digesting it, and then you're ex kind of taking the relevant pieces and explaining that back to this person over here. There's a lot of kind of information being passed around and, and yeah. you being kind of a conduit for that. And yeah, it, it, it's, it, it's fun. Even if you're, you know, not somebody again, who wants to go to the after work social hour. Um, but if you, if you really just want to write code for eight hours a day, that's more of an IT type of job. BI, BI is gotcha. not up. You will write code, you will play with fun tech, but you'll do a lot of other stuff too. Yeah, no, that makes sense. That makes sense. Now with this next question, obviously taking out that, I guess you could say misconception, because the next question I'm going to ask you is, what's the biggest misconception in this field? If you take the one that maybe if that, I don't know if that one's huge, but I have heard that before, the one we just asked you about. Um, what's another one that 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 you've noticed throughout your years in, in, in this field? No, I think we I think we've tackled probably what I would consider to be the two biggest. One, that it's, it's, that it's a field for people who just want to 
code and, and don't want to kind of work with people. And two, that it's a field that requires a, a ton of math. Um, yeah, those are the two biggest ones, correct? That makes I, sense. I, I would, if if I had to had to throw a third one out there, um, probably that, I wouldn't say this is a, it, it, this is something that maybe it's unexpected. So I guess you could say that the opposite of it's a misconception, which is that, you know, you'll, you, you won't have to, you won't be exposed to sort of the, kind of the politics and the, and of, of operations and the company that you work mm -hmm. with as, as a technical person. But at least in business intelligence, you or maybe a better way to put it is you won't have access to executives at a company as a as a as a as an analyst because you're a techie. You know, you're you're not you're not in that executive food chain at all. You're you're removed yeah. from that. But as as a data data analyst and a BI analyst, you are very much given tons of opportunities to talk directly to executives because wow. they're the people who are running the business with the reports and the analysis you give them. Like they, they fly by, that is the controls on the plane that they're flying. So on one hand, this could be nerve wracking when your phone rings and the executive is unhappy because the numbers either are wrong, hopefully not, or they just don't make him look good, which that's also uncomfortable, but sometimes that just happens, you know? Either way, you are not at all in some kind of a tech bubble where you only ever talk to other tech people like you are mm. you are absolutely given tons of opportunities to if you want network with executives or at the very least kind of get the opportunity to impress them and I, i've seen plenty of examples of people who started out in kind of business intelligence and analytics and ended up being just kind of broader umbrella executives because they built relationships with other executives they un and they understood the business operations both from an operational standpoint and an analytical standpoint, which is pretty great prep to be in, in a leadership role. Nice, nice. This uh, this next question that I want to ask you is a little bit a little bit funky, I'd say. Um, definitely not what we're trying to push, but I want to ask because it, it's great to know both sides. If you were to convince someone not, so not to join this field, what would you say? I would say if, like what, and what I mean by that is like, what are like the, I guess the downfalls of working in this field in a sense, you know what I mean? Because the following question I'm going to ask you is how would you, how would you sell this to someone to work? In this field? Gotcha. So gotcha. Those, okay. Those are the two sides that I'm throwing at you there. I would, I would say if the idea of occasionally being, occasionally taking some heat for something that isn't really at all your fault, it <laughs> sounds terrible. You might want to think twice because again, you are publishing numbers and explaining findings that decision makers at your company are absolutely making their decisions based on them. So if the numbers you give them are not to their liking, even if it's not your fault or, or perhaps if they're wrong, but maybe the, the, the system is just feeding you incorrect data and you turned around and churned that up and then put it in a report. You, you, you're probably going to take heat for things that aren't really your fault. And it may happen I won't say regularly, but it'll happen. So that's just something that, if that sounds bad, I mean, that probably, that kind of thing probably happens in other fields too, to some extent. But I would say in reporting a little bit more, your your reports definitely have a bullseye on them, depending on how high they go in the company. So that's, yeah, it's uh, something that, you know, get your shield ready for those arrows yeah. occasionally. <laughs> and then for the, on the opposite end, if you were to pitch it to someone that it can, like for someone that is interested in, this field, what are the key best points of this or like best parts of the job? I'd say the diversity. You don't, it's it's a career path where you, you don't really have to choose kind of one way to develop yourself professionally. You don't, mm -hmm. you can't, you don't just develop yourself by learning more programming languages. You do, you can learn programming languages. You can learn all kinds of cool tech. You can get exposure to like even machine learning and AI stuff, which I have over the years, just by your proximity to uh, machine learning and like predictive analytics teams, but you can also develop yourself in terms of your, your, your interpersonal skills, your presentation skills, your knowledge of the business operations. It, it's, you can learn a lot of different kind of whole modes of thinking and whole types of skills. And mm. the role that I feel like it would be a tough combination to find really elsewhere. Like you're, if you're what they call a business analyst, which is somebody who kind of like generates requirements for the IT team, 
you're not really doing anything really technical. You're kind of all on that interacting with the business side of things. If you work in IT, as a developer, you do a lot of programming, but you probably don't understand the business in a deep way. You probably don't talk to executives a lot. You don't analyze data. But if you're a, a business intelligence analyst, you kind of do all those things to some extent. So you can kind of yeah. move whichever way you, you can move into the business. You can move into maybe a data science type role. You can move into IT. I've seen people kind of go all, all of those different directions. So that's, yeah, that's probably the diversity of the roles would probably be what I, what I would pitch. That's huge. I mean, I feel like uh, it, it's pretty nice when you get to kind of dip your toes into different areas. And even, even if you're not looking to like uh, become an expert in this field, just having some kind of knowledge is always great. So that's a that's a big selling point, I'd say. Yep. Now, I, I, at the beginning, you said that this this field can be very lucrative. I feel like nowadays it's not bad that that a lot of people cu are curious before kind of getting into a field, kind of what the compensation can look like and what money can look like. Um because it's it's obviously a big concern and, and that's how we are able to live, right? You have right. to make money at the end of the day. You can exactly. like your job, but you have to make money. Um, what, what what I want to ask is, what is an average salary? Maybe if, if, if you know the differences between salary-wise between a BI analyst and a data analyst, or if they're the same, then just one salary. Um, what's an average salary? What's something that someone can expect, expect when they're coming into the field versus um, someone that's kind of been there for a while and and you know has that reputation behind sure um I, first of all i'll have to throw out a disclaimer about market forces and the differences in different areas uh i understand if you live in certain areas like san francisco or new york city salaries are going to be really high because your rent's probably five thousand dollars a month so yeah and i still living super high right Makes so sense. yeah cost of living is crazy so the salary is going to be a little higher than probably a lot higher than elsewhere so i'm going to focus more on kind of outside of those outlier areas uh okay. using my kind of my local area the jacksonville market jacksonville is kind of a mid-sized city with sort of a lower cost of living so i think it's probably fairly representative generally i think data analyst and business intelligence analyst salaries are very similar reflecting mm -hmm. the overlapping nature of the jobs yeah and i would say you're in this market your starting salary, if you you know have have a strong skill set, you know you interview well, probably in in the seventy could be any sixty to eighty kind of range, um, and then within a few within a few years, within probably I'd say five or fewer years, if you establish a good work history, I mean six figures is absolutely on the table, uh, depending on depending on you know how much responsibility you're willing to take on, what kind of company you're working for, um, obviously. Large companies tend to pay more. Uh, large big banks tend to pay very well compared to other companies. Also tend to have really good benefits. But then the downside, of course, is you're a very very tiny cog in a huge machine. So sometimes you're you're not quite as connected to the value that your work provides, which can be a little. It can take some of the fulfillment out of it. Whereas with a smaller company, it's super easy to see how the thing that I did today made a difference. But then the pay is probably not quite as good. But if I had to had to put a number on it, like what to expect when you first start out in a normal market, maybe around seventy, um, and then just you know, you would you should expect that number to climb as you get more experience. Sometimes though, you you just will have to switch jobs. Companies like to kind of lock you into that two to three percent increase every year, or sometimes not at all. And you know, if you don't ever, if you're not willing to leave to take a different role somewhere. You know, you might just be sitting there getting your 2% raise every year. Um, the biggest raises I've ever had have always been when either I left to go to a new role and got a substantial raise, or I almost left and then my company say, oh, come come back, we'll give you a raise. Um, yeah. Very rarely will that just come from sort of the goodness of someone's heart. Like, you know what, we'll just, you know, we'll just give you more money because <laughs> um, normally there's there's an element of bargaining involved, but you're, mm -hmm. you're bargaining with your your skill and your experience. You're saying like, I, I'm a valuable contributor and, and I, and this is an open market. Uh, so pay me or, uh, or I will go somewhere where I will be paid, you know? Yeah, no, I completely understand that. I also love how you touched about, um, uh, touched on the, uh, like the Im impact on like some, just, I, I've, I've seen it a lot where some people really, um, which is great to have is like some people really want to make an impact on like, with their work that they're doing. So, I feel like it, it depends on what you're looking to get. Cause if you're looking for the most amount of money, 
like you said, it might be at a bigger company. And unfortunately, your impact is going to be hinged. So it's, it's, it's kind of like one of those things, right, where it's like a balance and scale. Uh, but I mean, sometimes you get kind of uh, maybe there's a middle ground where you have uh, there's some like uh, you see the impact that your work is doing and also getting paid pretty fair. So, yeah. Yeah, it's all I like that. It's like, and you know, balance and priorities. If you're, you know, you're you're a young person, you you just want to kind of build up your financial nest egg, and or or maybe you've got a family and you're 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 just trying to you know get a bigger house or something. That you know, maybe your your main priority is just who's going to pay me the most, and you, you know, you don't care so much about what kind of hours you're working, who you who you're working for, you know, how mm -hmm. fulfilling your work is. But I think for most people, like you said, finding that kind of I've got some fulfillment, but you know, I'm also making a competitive salary that's kind of covering my needs. That's that's probably the best approach. Yeah, I I, I agree. Um, this next section is kind of oh, it's it's what we call the technical section. So it's okay. going to be some technical questions. Um, maybe for our viewers out there that that have heard some of these, but don't have a solid answer. We have a professional here today, so no math, you right? The break. <laughs> no math, no okay, math. Okay. Um, and the first be, one is you looking at my calculator off screen. <laughs> Just have it off screen so nobody could see yep. it. Yep. Um, the first one is actually about uh, VBA programming. We okay. touched upon this before, but let's say if we have kind of let's put us in the mindset where we have a viewer that is a web developer knows about other programming languages. How can you differentiate the difference between maybe like some of those like web programming languages in VBA, like? Um, what are like the key standouts for, for someone that doesn't know anything about VBA, maybe has some knowledge of, let's say, JavaScript or some, something like that? What are the key differences that come to mind? Okay, so also use case use cases. Yeah. I feel like it's 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 good, but I, I could it's uh it's it's something I'm interested to hear as well. Use cases and limitations as well. Sure. So comparing it, it, it that's an interesting question to compare it to. It just. Be, to being being honest, more modern programming languages like Python and JavaScript. So, if if you have a background in those languages, you will probably find the syntax of VBA to be somewhat clunky. It it is um, you have to declare data types for variables. For example, it's not dynamically typed like Python. Like Python, just if you're writing the code from scratch, Python in particular just kind of is a more joyful experience. You know, it's it's a more English like prose. Uh, yeah. VBA is an it's based on Visual Basic, which is kind of one of the the original programming languages, and, and the syntax is very similar to, to Visual Basic. So that's that's probably your your downside. You, it, that and you don't have the benefit of these really advanced integrated development environments that you do mm -hmm. or modern programming languages. Like if you're working with Python, for example, there there's uh, an IDE called PyCharm, which is just just loaded. To the, to the gills with features that kind of help you as you code. VBA does have an editor and it does have some cool features, but the the interface just kind of looks like it's got that web 1.0 look because Microsoft <laughs> does it, not even 2.0. It did definitely not got even 2.0. It's kind of got that 90s look to it. Um, <laughs> so that's the bad news. The good news is it's an extremely powerful language, mostly because it is the language, as as much as Microsoft has has threatened, like, you know, we we might go another direction every time in terms of how to automate Excel, every time they do that, there there are just there are like mass uprisings and protests because even in like Wall Street, perhaps especially on Wall Street in the world of investment banking and so on, there are so many models, financial models that are built using just reams of VBA code because models are built in Excel. And the best way to automate Excel is with VBA. VBA has access to what's called the Excel object model. So if you think of mm. all of the little things, all the widgets and features of, of a spreadsheet as objects, there are ways to automate Excel with Python. Um, working on that now, actually. But those, but Python and any other languages you might use to automate Excel don't have access to that entire object model. In other words, you can't control as much of Excel as you can with VBA. VBA, if you want to do serious work in terms of automating Excel, VBA is just the language you need to use. And Excel is such a powerful application that can do so many different things. Just that in and of itself absolutely makes it worth learning VBA. Now, the other thing is VBA doesn't just automate Excel. 
it automates Office. So you can automate Microsoft uh, Outlook. You can automate Word. Um, and, and the other thing I'd the say entire, about, The entire thing, right? The whole Office suite. And you could actually, yeah. you know, you can write scripts that, you know, for example, um, do something with a spreadsheet, pull some data in, save it, create a pivot table, then attach that spreadsheet to an email and send that email out to a distro, all of that with VBA. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, in the sense that Office applications are extremely powerful and VBA is the language to, to, to automate them, VBA is very powerful. The other thing, and I touched on this earlier that I think is really cool about VBA, is that it's just a great way to learn to program if you don't have that background because mm -hmm. the feature there's a feature called the Macro Recorder that lets you just hit a button and say, record macro, and then you just kind of click around in your spreadsheet and you do things that you might want to automate. And then you go into the code editor and Excel has written the VBA code that when you run it, will do the exact actions that you just took. So now without knowing how to code, you just wrote a program. And then what you'll, you'll find yourself doing is going into that code and saying, huh, what would happen if I changed this line to what would happen if I changed this name? And suddenly you're getting that intuition for how code works and you're writing actual useful programs that automate stuff and like save time almost on day one, which is, which to me is really cool. So it's a great, it's a great entryway or a, a, like a gateway to kind of this, this world of tech, especially if you have no background in um, any language at all, programming yep. language or anything like and that. It, and, it, and if you're an, and if you're already an expert in Excel, it lets you kind of amplify the stuff you already know, because now you can take these things you know how to do in Excel and you can do them, you can automate them programmatically with VBA. Very nice. Very nice. The next question I want to ask you is something that I completely know nothing about, um, but I've heard the term a lot and it's uh, data cleaning. Um, so I wanted to ask you, can, for someone that doesn't know anything about that, um, can you touch upon that and kind of like the what what it entails? Yes. Um, so data cleaning basically is necessary because there's a lot of data out there that is either just just flat out not accurate or incomplete in some way, or a lot of times not not inaccurate, strictly speaking, but not suitable for presentation to people who are making decisions with for non technical people. So most of the data that you you work with as an analyst comes from some information system out of business, some system where somebody is actually using, is sitting behind a computer using that system, typing stuff in, entering data, that data gets written to a database somewhere. Mm -hmm. And typically that database is not designed with an analyst in mind. They didn't design, they designed the database to be efficient. They didn't design it so that you as the analyst can easily go in there and just sort of, you know, fetch all the data you need on demand. Mm -hmm. So cleaning often means reshaping the data so that it's easier to fetch into a report. Sometimes you'll find that there are free form fields in the, in the actual computer application that connects to the database where people mm -hmm. just enter junk. And maybe it's, it's a free form field where you're supposed to type a phone number, but they don't always type phone numbers or if they do, they, it's just three digits or yeah. you know, maybe they try to spell the numbers out with words that kind of oh, thing. God. Oh, <laughs> that's yeah. terrible. Like, you, yeah, you'd, you wouldn't believe it. It's free form fields are the bane of an analyst's existence. You see that and you're like, oh, no. <laughs> it, you know, it's going to be kind of funny, but like in a tragic way. Um, yeah. tragic it's funny for the first couple of seconds. And then when you figure out you have to do something about it, you're like, oh, God. Yep. And the worst part is typically explaining to people look, no matter what we do here, this is not <laughs> never going to be perfect. There are where there are going to be, no matter how complex your code is, there's going to be something somebody typed in there that's not, that's going to slip through your pattern, you know. Yeah. But um, but yes, for for those reasons, cleaning data is, is not just an important part. Yeah, I would say it's it's a pretty big part of your job. Like you you spend a decent chunk of your time taking this kind of raw, messy data and just reshaping it into a form that you can actually pull into a report. I think a lot of, I think maybe this is a misconception I could have, I could have touched on earlier that people think being an analyst is mostly putting together really flashy visualizations and dashboards, which is a part of it. But a big part of it is just taking this really messy, junky data and, and getting it 
getting it shaped up to the point where now you can put it in a report. I would almost say, from my experience, I probably spend more time doing that than actually building, you know, building the dashboards and doing analysis. And, you know, it's, yeah. uh, I find it, I find it fun, but, you know, maybe not everybody would. Some people just kind of can't wait to get to the dashboard part, but that's me. Yeah, they, they, I can imagine some people really like working on kind of like the visual stuff and uh -huh. make thing looks, making things look pretty in a sense. This, uh, this next question might tie into this last question about data cleaning, but how do you deal with inconsistent or missing data in your data sets? Like, what, what's the approach there? I would say the first step is, and this this does pretty much tie into what I, to what I was just talking about, is to understand where that comes from, from the system user's perspective. So there's mm -hmm. always, wherever the data, whatever data you're looking at, ultimately a human being probably produced that data on the other end of the workflow. Like they're sitting in a computer, typing stuff in, and either that inconsistent data is caused by a bug in the system, which sometimes does happen. You may have a an entry field that's supposed to capture a date, but for some reason they made the data type a text data type. And now it's messing all the dates up and the dates are all convoluted in a way that you've got to kind of transform back into a date. Or just to, to go back to the example of a freeform text field, in that case, it's the system's fault, but it's kind of the user's fault because they are supposed to type things in in a consistent way, but they don't and the system doesn't make them. So in both of those cases, the first and most important step is just to understand where are these where are these inconsistencies coming from? Are, are they structural? Are they systemic? And only then do you kind of know how you can how you can solve for them. Um, and solving for them that's that's the technical part. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't, and and sometimes mm -hmm. you can come up with an uh, kind of an imperfect solution, especially when you're dealing with freeform text. You can come up with like a regular expression to search for basically a, a pattern. A, a kind of a way of specifying a certain pattern and say, okay, look for this pattern in this freeform text, but it's not going to be perfect. And another part of this is communicating to your stakeholders, you know, realistic expectations. This is a freeform text field. We are doing our best to capture as much good data out of this as we possibly can, but it's, we're, we're some, we're going to miss some things as a result of just the structural limitations of the system. Uh, so again, a lot of it goes back to sort of communication on, on both ends. Yeah, no, no. It, I, th I feel like communication is a big, big part of this. Uh, from what I'm getting from this conversation so far is communication is very important in this field. And the good thing is it's not, you know, it's not communication like you've got to be an expert blog, you know, blogger or something. It's really just yeah. a willingness. It's just a willingness to go talk to somebody and an ability to just kind of explain stuff. It's it's not, you know, advanced essay writing it's just um you know pick up you know pick up the phone call somebody and say hey this is this is the deal and just explain it to them but a lot of people just yeah i i, I don't know don't want to take that step or, or or are unwilling to take that step but it, but if you do you will really stand out people will be like oh wow like if, if this person really kind of got me up to speed on what was going on and when you get ahead of things before they kind of blow up that is such that is that helps so much it, it people ex especially executives love to kind of be forewarned about things versus sort of being surprised by data quality issues when they show up like suddenly the report mm -hmm. breaks because all the dates are showing up as weird text strings they'll be way way less upset by that if you kind of explain in advance what's happening and and kind of why yeah no that totally makes sense um uh, this next question is how would you how would you define a successful or a great business intelligence um, project or a, an assignment, I guess, or uh, how would you define that? What, what are the, the key things that you would say, um, what, what are the key things that actually signify a successful, a successful project? Okay. The, the obvious one I would say is, you know, your stakeholders are happy, but, but the not, one. <laughs> that's the, that's the obvious one. But I would say yeah. a non-obvious spin on that is, this probably doesn't mean you built them exactly what they had in mind to begin with. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's it's kind of an ongoing collaborative process. So like normally people, and this is probably true with web development, for example, normally your customers got this thing in mind, mm -hmm. but then you try to get an initial iteration in our, in the case of an analyst of, of a report or a presentation out to them and just say, what do you think? Here, here's kind of a, 
minimum viable product, if you will. Mm -hmm. And very often, oh, those numbers aren't really what I thought. Like I was expecting this this report to say that I was 100% in this particular metric. And it actually shows that I'm 79% in this metric. And that's not good. So there will inevitably be back and forth. And a lot of that back and forth will, will center on, well, how do you even define the metric? Like what what it, what is the grade based on? Yeah. So by the end, you know, you want a, prod, a product that maybe isn't what they originally asked for, but is what they need. And the second thing is it's accurate. Um, this is something that, yeah, most good analysts, I think all good analysts I've known are, are almost religious about regardless of the pressure you're under, your data, your numbers have to be accurate to the best of your ability. Like they just have yeah. to. I, I've had people call me somewhat irate because their report was showing essentially that their department wasn't doing very well relative to their peers and pretty much just saying you need to change these numbers. And, you know, as an analyst, it's kind of an ethical thing. Like the numbers are what they are. Like if, if there's something wrong with our logic or if there's something wrong with the system, we can work with that. But until and unless we prove those things, the numbers are what they are. It's kind of an unwritten, you know, analyst. Numbers don't lie kind of thing. Exactly. So that's another part of a solution is to the best of your knowledge and ability, the data it is putting out is accurate. Um, now I'd say probably the, the third thing is that you've produced something that that people are trained on, that's at least somebody in that team, and this is especially true if you're consulting for smaller businesses, that mm -hmm. when you leave, if something changes, so, you know, the, the, the underlying data changes or they need to add some feature, that somebody, at least somebody, is empowered to to understand that that system well enough to change it and, 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 and modify it as needed. Uh, and good documentation helps with that too. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's, that's fair. That's, uh, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense, especially with just in general, uh, kind of touching on the, you said documentation at the end, but just, mm -hmm. I feel like documentation kind of ties into the whole communication thing. It, it just does. has to be clear in a sense. Yep. You know what I mean? Yep. Um, this next section is actually one of my favorite sections. So it's, uh, it's, it's what I like to call the impactful section. I like to ask some impactful questions and things that, um, are just kind of more pressing issues in, 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 in today's world. Um, and the first question I want to ask you about is kind of what are the what what are the biggest challenges that uh, the business intelligence or data analyst field faces at the moment, or in especially you can even touch on with uh, with all this AI stuff. What what are some of the biggest challenges that are coming up? Maybe that you can see in the next five ten years, uh, present or in the future. Well, um, I I think that the present concern is probably really related somewhat to maybe the future concern um mm -hmm. the, the the big i think the big concern now is that there there's there's just so much data so there are massive reams of data out there and mm -hmm. i think a lot of companies don't even know where, on one hand don't know where to begin to, to to start you know which data set do we want to ask what questions of but there's also a tremendous amount of pressure to get results out of that data quickly and to get the results that they like to see out of that data quickly. And that is, that's just kind of an ongoing challenge you face as an analyst. You know, you're, you're under pressure to kind of deliver answers quickly. And often, you know, well, I'll say this, the right answers, the quote unquote right answers that, that people want to see are, are rarely rejected. The ones that don't kind of show people what they might want to see are, are, are often more controversial. Um, yeah. and, and in, in an environment where, everything's kind of data driven and there's just so much more and more complex data to work with that you can't just just snap your fingers and get a result from mm -hmm. that is that is a challenge now the challenge how that's related to I, I think AI what concerns me about AI is that it makes it so much easier to generate the kind of content that populates the internet or populates really anything any kind of text-based data that there's now going to be even more data out there and much of it probably of lower quality because it's being generated by AI. You, you, you imagine all the stuff out there on the internet now that's being churned out because somebody is basically using a chat GPT or some other um, large language model to generate it, or even programming code for that matter. Mm -hmm. And all of this, I mean, how was chat GPT trained? It was trained on internet text, text data. Yeah, exactly. So, now you a lot of that text data 
is literally generated by the same thing that's being trained on it. So, <laughs> Uh, this sounds like an endless loop of, of like almost like a snowball effect. Like it's going to get, it's like a lot more data coming. That Yes. It's a lot, a lot more data. And because now it's so easy to generate that text data and it may be of somewhat more derivative of, of, or lower quality, but you never know. Perhaps there will be a way to easily distinguish, okay, this was AI generated. This wasn't, but it's kind of hard to know, uh, at least now. So that is probably the concern. Like we're already drowning in data. Now we're going to be even deeper. Like, you know, if we were chest deep, now we're like chin deep and it's some of it's <laughs> AI generated, some of it's people generated. That's probably going to be a challenge going forward. Nice, nice. That, that makes sense as well. Um, this next question is about, it could be present or, um, yeah, let's say, so what tools, what tools do you see transforming um the industry and this could be tools technologies as in like maybe some i don't know if really in this in this field how much uh like if there's much ai assistance or anything like that particularly in this field but um are there any emerging tools that you think can transform and make the job easier for you guys in the future whether it's ai or not well i where i think ai can help and i'm seeing a couple examples of this is with what's called exploratory data analysis. This is not like the presentation phase where you, you, you're sure of your conclusions and you're presenting them in some like stylish format. This is where you're just starting to figure out what's going on with this data, even what questions to ask or just generally what are some trends. And AI can actually be pretty good about that. So Power BI has some AI powered visualizations. Now, the last, you know, as of fairly recently, I wasn't just a huge user of, of that feature because I, I, I'm comfortable and familiar with Power BI, so I kind of feel like I can do my own exploratory data analysis. But especially if you're an end user who's not terribly uh, skilled with Power BI, these AI visuals just pretty much just let you say, hey, here's a table of data. Tell me stuff about it. And it will spit out some like summary statistics and some correlations between different columns of data and that and, and that that's one thing but uh chatgpt late just recently came out with a new feature called code interpreter which is mm -hmm. kind of like the ai visuals in power bi but on steroids so code interpreter lets you upload a text file and it will basically let you do exploratory data, data analysis using that text prompt you can say show me, tell me about some trends that you find in this data. And it will say, well, uh, these two fields are almost perfectly negatively correlated. When this number goes up, this number goes down. And now that's something that if you're a skilled analyst, you could have found on your own, but yeah, it'll, it'll find it quickly and you don't necessarily need to, you know, no Python to, to do that. So that's, I think, it, I think it'll make it easier for non-technical people to at least kind of sniff out some basic trends I don't think it will replace analysts because I think analysts will still be needed to verify this content, to give additional context, to explain it to different audiences in different ways, uh, to present it in to different audiences in different ways. But it, it, it's a good starting point. It's just like it's it's sort of just a more advanced version of Google, you know. It, yeah, yeah. Let's get get a starting point faster. Yeah, I think I think uh, outside of this field as well, I think. I mean, obviously a huge concern right now is uh, AI automation with jobs and all this. Uh, but I think we're very, very far from it reaching, maybe, maybe it will at some point reach that potential where it can have that effect. But right now there's just too much inconsistency with it. And yeah. you still need these people. You need people in, the, in, in, this, in these job roles to verify information and and kind of, like you said, give context stuff outside of just this field, but and I think in a lot of fields, in my opinion. Yep. I The optimistic, and this is the view I tend to take, the optimistic view is as long as you're you're curious about how the tools work and you're willing to kind of explore their the different use cases, it's just going to turn you into like a supercharged version of you. Where now, it just like when Google first came out, instead of, when you didn't know how to do something, you had to pull up a, you know, a three inch thick book. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm dating myself here. Um, that's actually what my computer's propped up on. Uh, one of those old books. 
But uh, yeah, and you got to thumb through the index. Like, okay, this is oh, page eight hundred eighty-five is 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 where the, the the applicable code is. Then Google came out, and it was like, oh my gosh, I can just type in, I can just say, you know, here's a line of code. What's wrong with this? And you get a Stack Overflow, and then ten minutes later, your problem solved. Well, now instead of Google, you just say, hey, here's a line of code. Why is this not working? And you just get a nice little paragraph spit out that explains it. So it's just yeah. Name it, I just look at it as that kind of evolution. It just makes you better at your job and faster, so you can focus on the stuff you probably like to do better anyway. Mm -hmm. No, that makes sense. That's a good way of looking at it. Um, now, this 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 next question is uh, something that I think is universally known, and it's in any field, no matter what you're doing. Um, you know, someone can face burnout. Burnout is a common thing, especially in tech, because although although we although ZTM makes great courses, it's still very hard stuff to learn. I think sometimes people forget that, that technology, is, it, it's just not easy to learn. You have to put in time, you have to dedicate yourself to it. Um, have you ever dealt with burnout? And what do you recommend for someone that maybe is having like kind of that moment where they're kind of stressed out about learning this kind of stuff? Um, what would you say is like a, a good approach to it, to dealing with burnout? I would say the closest I've come to burnout, ironically, was not from learning too much, it was almost mm. learning too little. Um, mm. I was in a job where I hadn't really done anything new skill-wise in a while. I was kind of using sort of the same kind of technical skill set that I had. I was supporting the same business for a while. Mm -hmm. And because I knew it really well, the responsibilities just kept piling up. So I was doing kind of the same type of stuff but more of it. So kind of like a high volume of work, but the work wasn't like super creative or interesting. And my loss of the time was not exactly the most sympathetic. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't say it was quite burnout, but it was a weird mixture of kind of like boredom and stress that I would not yeah. recommend to anyone. Um, so my, my prescription for that would be when it comes to the stress level of the job, like a lot of that really does come down to who you're working for. Um, uh, if you've got a great manager, you know, probably stick with them as long as you can. Uh, if that <laughs> manage, you know, like I, for a while, I, I worked for the same manager for like eight years, I think, in a row at one point. And mm -hmm. I just tried to do different things under her because she was a great manager. Like she was, you know, she expected really good work, but she was nice and reasonable. And, you know, she wouldn't, if you, you know, said, hey, I'm sick today, she wouldn't be like, all right, I'm going to call your doctor. You know, for <laughs> I need to verify. <laughs> yeah, like she was a very, you know, nice, reasonable person. Whereas this other manager, yeah. not so much. Um, so uh, between kind of the, the job being high stress and high pressure, and also I'm not really doing a lot new, it wasn't ideal. So what I would say is, on the one hand, always look for opportunities to do to broaden your skill set or to broaden the types of of skills that you're developing. Mm -hmm. From my experience, that will help you, that that will really help alleviate that burnout. Like your mind just doesn't want to just do the same thing over and over again forever. At some point, it, go, doing, six, something, doing something that you've done a thousand times, 50 hours a week is, is terrible. Doing something, doing a few different things that are kind of new and interesting 50 hours a week, maybe not so terrible. Mm -hmm. um, now getting, now getting out of a position that's just intrinsically high stress, um, you know, or, or manage that or, or manager who's maybe not so understanding. That's a different deal. I mean, you know, it, it can take a while, but uh, I would just say in all situations, just value yourself. You know, you've worked hard to develop yourself into somebody who's, who's really skilled and has a lot to offer. So if, yeah. you, if you feel like you're not being valued up to the level that you bring to the table, well, you know, that's that's where, you know, eventually you'll 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 find your way out. And but just don't hesitate to do that. But um, but, you know, diversifying your skills helps with that always never allow yourself to get stuck in a rut where you're good at these two things and that's comfortable so you're just going to do that because mm -hmm. in the tech world those you know those two skills may not cut it five to five to ten years from now anyway so it's always in your best interest to keep learning new things because it's interesting and because it just makes you more marketable and it makes makes life more interesting yeah that's a that's a great i think a great response i think um what you said about that 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 point about just diversifying uh, your knowledge because I feel like burnout a lot of the times it can happen from a bad work situation but a lot of the times it's because you're almost either oversaturated or 
um, you're just constantly dealing with one thing or trying to do one yep. thing. And sometimes diversifying out of that mindset, shifting to something else, trying to learn new things can kind of give that your your mind like a refresher in a sense. I'm not saying ditch what you're what's what's causing the burnout. Sometimes that is something you still have to learn or something like that. But um, it, there, there's there's ways of handling it, just like you said, by diversifying what you're learning. It's probably like like cross training in sports. You, you yeah. physically burn out if you just do the exact same thing of like all you ever do is push ups and literally nothing else that's probably not good for you long term you know no. it's better to do a lot of different things that kind of work work yourself in in, in different ways from different angles y and you'll just be better rounded overall and it'll be more interesting and fun yeah and if you're just doing one thing you're probably uh it's probably going to lead to injury so i guess in yep. in a uh, relatable way if uh if you're just learning one thing or you're very frustrated on one thing it's probably going to lead to you just stop trying to like you might just stop trying to learn that field in general and switch completely to a different area so uh, i like that i like that Alrighty, travis so this next section that i want to do is what i like to call the very fun sections and we're going to start off with the would you rather questions so okay. like when you were young and you had friends you'd be like would you rather do this or that so it's similar but we're going to tie this into obviously data analytics and all this stuff um and i'm going to look down here just because i have my questions down here and uh, we'll start off with the first one would you rather face an angry mob of end users with faulty reports or break the news to the CEO or the man in charge or woman, man or woman in charge that the data warehouse has crashed? Boy, uh, both of those are hair raising scenarios. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna, this is rapid fire. So I'm going to go. I'd rather face the CEO because there's only one of them. You know, there's more than one of the angry mob. I've only got to deal with one CEO. Unless the CEO is like Chuck Norris or something, in which case maybe the angry mob. <laughs> if the CEO is this really badass person, it might be worse. Right. But I agree with you. I like that answer. In general, like I'll, I'd rather one on one than one on like fifty angry people. Makes sense. Makes sense. Uh, this next question is: Would you rather only work with real time data or with historical data? So you only have one option here. I'd say definitely historical data, even if by historical we mean like captured every 30 minutes because when you're dealing with real-time data you are competing with you that means you're fetching it from the application database which means you're competing with the actual application itself i did this once upon a time um i kind of hacked into the back end of a of a production <laughs> app just to get analytics out of it and uh the the it administrator discovered that and i was not a very popular person for some quite some time after this so definitely historical data Historical data for the win. Uh, next question. Would you rather work on a team where everyone knows less than you do or work on a team where everyone knows more than you do? That one's easy. Much rather option B. The, the, the kind of stressful job situation I described earlier was definitely one where I was the most experienced person and kind of had the knowledge. Mm -hmm. And that just ends up with you getting a lot of responsibility piled on your shoulders without really learning anything. But if you're, while by contrast, if you're the, the least experienced person on the team, the least knowledgeable, it is stressful. Um, but man, you learn so fast. You, it, it's you, you like every day you go home a better analyst than you were the day before, which is really cool. Yeah. I feel like, uh, I don't want to say too much about it, but I feel like if you're the smartest one, you kind of limit yourself. Like there's, there's yeah. not much growth you can do. Um, because there's so much that you can teach yourself, you know what I mean? You, it's, it, you really learn from others, from, from, from people that are very experienced. Um, I've next heard, I've heard a distinction between, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this correctly, but there's, there's distress and there's you stress. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it's EU and then stress. Okay. And from what I've read, like one is bad. The distress is like somebody's yelling at you or you feel stressed or overwhelmed or even bored. Mm -hmm. You stress is where an example, for example, uh, you're, you're a little anxious because you're the least knowledgeable person, but then you're like working really hard to acquire all these new skills. You stress is kind of like, you know, exercise. It kind of hurts, but it's like good for you. Whereas distress is just like, I tripped and fell down, you know, it hurts and it's yeah. probably not good for me, you know? Yeah, no, I like that. Um, the next one, would you rather have perfect data with no tools to analyze it or have powerful tools, but extremely messy data, messy data? Definitely powerful tools and messy data. Because if all, if data was perfect, they wouldn't need guys like me. You know, 
Plus, if I, w I want powerful tools because you want cool tech to play with. So that yeah, that one's easy. Nice, nice. Uh, the last one in this section, would you rather tackle a huge project with the tight deadline or have a light workload but an extremely difficult client? I'd probably say the light workload and difficult client, because if it's a huge workload, there's just no, there's nothing you're going to do. You know, you're, you're, you're kind of stuck with that for a long time, but Hey, if it's a light workload, I'll just, I'll just get the project done in a couple of weeks and leave, you know, <laughs> on the don't best. Have to, don't have to talk too long to the client, to the difficult client. <laughs> exactly. Nice, nice, nice. I feel like those weren't too bad for you. You, you seem, I feel like the first one may have been the, the hardest one, the warehouse yeah. crashing. Yes. <laughs> oh boy. That. You you you, you kind of like you brought back some bad memories. I was like, oh, <laughs> I, was, I was remembering. I don't think I've ever had an actual angry mob, but I've definitely had days where it kind of felt that way. So yeah, that was a, that was a rough scenario. <laughs> yeah, I bet. I bet. Next section is the true or false section. Um, pretty self-explanatory as well. The first one, true or false? Microsoft Excel was initially released in the 1970s. That feels a little old. From, uh, I'm going to say 80s, sometime in the 80s. I'm going to say false on that one. It is false, correct. Uh, you got well, that correct. I think I, I couldn't get that one wrong. I'm the Excel guy. <laughs> oh, man. I, was, that I, was, think, I think it was in the 80s. Yeah, high stake. Okay. Very, very important question. Um, second one, Communi true or false, communication skills are not important for business intelligence analysts since they mostly work with data, which we we. We talk about reasons. this all day. Yeah, for all the reasons we discussed, that's a, that's a big old false. Yeah, big false, big false there. Uh, next one, true or false? Business intelligence analysts typically work in isolation without any interaction with other business units or stakeholders. This is another one that it seems like some of these we've already touched upon. Well, we, but I, I probably kind of wandered out in the weeds a little bit on my answers to the other questions, and thereby kind of indirectly. Yeah, but they were great answers. <laughs> So yeah, I would obviously big old false for again all the reasons we kind of covered earlier. That you'll, yeah. you'll be spending a lot of time communicating with a lot of stakeholders. Yep. Next one, uh, true or false? In Excel, you can create a 3D graph that pops out of your screen when you're wearing 3D glasses. Oh man, that sounds like a terrific feature idea. Um, I'll chalk this up to in the same category as like aliens and Bigfoot. I'm not sure if it's true, but I really want it to be true. I don't, I'm going to say, I don't think it is, but I really hope it is. It's false. You do have the 3D graphs, as you know, but it yeah. doesn't, it doesn't bump out of your oh, Like, like the, the old movie Jaws 3D, where it's, this is an old eighties movie, but if, if you, if you watch it with the 3D glasses, it looks like the shark is coming out of the screen at you. Like I was picturing that, but with an Excel chart, that's a fantastic idea. You should pitch that to Microsoft. <laughs> I'm gonna get in touch with uh, with Microsoft. This is a th honestly this this is a feature that has to be added. It it, it is. Um, the last one here, true or false? A business intelligence analyst, a business intelligence analyst role involves translating business needs to technical specifications. That is absolutely a true, but pl true plus yes, absolutely. That is a that is a part of the job, but obviously not all the job. No, there's more to it, but correct, that is true as well. They used uh, really technical words in that one. I almost couldn't read it. <laughs> um, let's go on to the next section, uh, which is the final one of these three fun sections. Uh, and this is the actual rapid fire question. So I'm okay. going to give you one or the other, and you pick which well, one. And, okay. and, the, and the first one is going to be a very controversial one nowadays. Uh, bar charts or pie charts? I got to be a contrarian and, and go with pie charts. I, I just... They're both useful, but I feel like pie charts are 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 are, are, are uh, just criminally underrated and, and too much maligned. So, and they have their place. So, I'm gonna go for go with pie charts. Now, I know that uh, we 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 briefly spoke about this uh, for the viewers out there before the interview, and I I kind of want to get before we continue on to the next ones. Why is it that that uh, pie charts get that rep? Well, what's for someone that doesn't know? Like, well, what what did that stem from? I, it's it's a little bit that they become less useful as there are as there uh, are more categories in your data. So imagine a pie chart split into like thirty five different categories where all the slight mm. like they're not exactly Very small like filling. They're not good portions. They're little tiny slices of pie that you know would barely would not satisfy your appetite. So they're not useful once you get past a certain number of of categories. 
Mm. But they're fine if you have, you know, probably less than 10 categories in your data. Pie charts are, I would argue, they show proportionality better than probably any other type of chart outside of maybe like a tree map or something more exotic like that. As to why they're maligned, eh, what charts are probably like anything else aesthetic. There are fashion trends come and go. And right now it's just kind of cool to, to just dunk on pie charts relentlessly. Uh, I've <laughs> known people who just say, I don't ever want to see a pie chart on my dashboard. You know, if that's your if that's your fashion choice, I will not put a pie chart in your dashboard. But pie charts do not, you know, I have no problem with pie charts at all. They just you just gotta know time and a place if you want to show proportionality among, you know, maybe ten or fewer different categories, pie charts are are your are your your best option. Yeah, so pretty pretty much it sounds from it not being like scalable with big big data sets or something like that. But yeah. I mean, I feel like everything has its a time and a place. So it has a purpose, you know what I mean? Exactly. There's a time and a place. They're not just bad. They just aren't, you know, they, they're not good for many situations, but they are good for some. Yeah, agreed. Okay, I like that. Uh, next one, data mining or text mining? I kind of feel like text mining is sort of a subset of data mining, so I would probably say data mining. Got it, got it. Uh, next one, structured data or unstructured data? Well, I'm a database guy from way back relational databases in particular. So I'd, I'd have to go with structured data. Structured data. There we go. Uh, okay. So for, for uh, data cleaning, satisfying or tedious? I would say it can be tedious, but then it's satisfying when you're done. So a mix of both. Tedious in the tedious while you're doing it, it's probably extremely tedious. Right. It can be. Now, I would say it, it is for many people. I personally kind of enjoy it, but you know, the process as you're sort of working your way through and finding um, what, you know, what the sources of inconsistencies are or like you've got all these different categories that you sort of want to roll up into a smaller number of categories. That stuff can be kind of tedious, but it's kind of fun, too. You know, it's just like putting a puzzle together. And then the end result, obviously, is pretty fulfilling. Yeah. And uh, the last one is ELT or uh, ETL. But it's definitely ETL, extract, transform, load. Although uh, ELT kind of sounds like a like an interesting sandwich. Like an yeah, I was thinking ELT. of a BLT. <laughs> I was like thinking of the same uh, thing. Or to be a uh, to be eggplant lettuce tomato maybe like a fr like like fried eggplant that could be good. Okay. BLT. Just because we didn't just because we didn't touch upon this, can you give us a brief? Um, this is we're done with the rapid fire, but can you give us a brief um, description of ETL and and uh, kind of what it is? Sure. So ETL is an acronym that stands for ext Extract, Transform, and Load. And this is basically the process or workflow by which you take this raw, messy data that was definitely not meant for analyst consumption that is generated by some system. Could be Facebook that generates it. Could be some internal information system that generates it. Mm -hmm. You fetch that data from that database. You transform and shape it in a way that makes it palatable for an analyst to like get insights from or build reports from. And then you load it typically into, and this is something we really didn't touch on, but normally analytics teams, especially bigger ones, will have their own database where they actually, where analysts write their queries and kind of do their exploratory work. Because as I, as I did mention earlier, if you're writing queries against a live production database, you are, your queries are competing with the actual customers using that, that application. So typically you'll want to, to grab that data from the production application, transform it, reshape it, clean it, then drop it into a database that the analytics team uses. And that's kind of the load part. And at that point, you're left with a database that hopefully kind of makes sense to an analyst and is easy to query and get insights from or build reports from. Okay, so it's kind of like the process encompassed into three letters. Yeah, uh, nice, nice. Well, the non, the kind of the non visualization, all the stuff that leads up to you being able to either analyze or visualize the data. Nice, very nice. Well, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure of a time, Travis. I only have a couple questions left, um, but I really do appreciate you coming on here and and doing this, man. So let me ask you these last few, and we'll wrap it up. Been a lot of um, yeah, me too, man. Um, if you could give yourself yourself one 
your younger self one piece of advice before you started this out. Maybe someone's in that exact same place where they're looking to get into this field. But now that you have the knowledge, what would you have gave yourself? Like, what would have been that one piece of advice? Kind of to what we talked about earlier, diversify your skill set and look for opportunities to apply the skills you're learning at work. So mm. if you're learning, and it, 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 I, it, I don't think it terribly matters how you diversify it, at least, especially when you're starting out, learn something useful. And then especially something that you could, you see an opportunity to apply, apply at work and then, and then immediately apply it, which will have the dual benefit of solidifying your skill but also kind of advertising your value for your company. So like for VBA, for example, if you're a data analyst who knows like SQL and Excel, learn VBA, and then at work, look for an opportunity to automate some Outlook process or some unwieldy Excel process using VBA. Now suddenly you're not just somebody who who learned VBA, you're somebody who applied it at work. And it's then you can you know put that on your resume, saved X number of, of business hours by automating X process with VBA. Mm. Now, the the next one is a very similar question, but for someone that's in the role, very entry, they're still very like very young into the role and and haven't don't have much experience. So maybe one one year of experience. Um, how what would you recommend to someone to progress uh, their career as much as they can? Um, this can be really high level or very detailed. Um, um, just I guess opinions or or recommendations from you. So. What do you think? Someone that's very young into their career, how do they set themselves up for the most successful career? Okay. Um, is it okay if I kind of make it specific to kind of an, a business intelligence analyst or like a data analyst by career? Of course. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'll say this because it's probably not quite as obvious. Um, don't hesitate to reach out to people who aren't in your department to learn more about the business operations that you're analyzing. So mm -hmm. regardless of what, you know, what kind of analytics role you're in, there is some kind of business process that is generating the data that you're analyzing and a secret weapon that you can have as an analyst that's really easy to get that I didn't figure out until I'd been doing it for a long time is that you can just go talk to somebody in the business and say, hey, can I shadow you for an hour or so and just see what and, and you kind of interview you and, and you tell me what are your pain points like when you're interacting with this system what well, what do you think are the flaws or what's your workflow like and also learn how that system works if you can even get access to the information system that's generating the data it'll be so much easier for you to make sense of all these little tables that you have to piece together and why data looks the way that it does so yeah don't don't hesitate to learn the business operations not to the point where you'd be a you know you'd you're doing the, the work yourself, but understand them conceptually and, and just get out and talk to people uh, who, who do that work in the business. So kind of diversify more, get get out of your little space. You know what I mean? With uh, Exactly. Nice, nice. I think that's Get, out, that's of, get out of the cubicle. The cubicle, that's the one. Get out of the cubicle. <laughs> Last question for you, man. Are you on any socials um, that you're willing to share that, that our audience can find you at? I, uh, I'm on LinkedIn, not super active on LinkedIn, uh, or really, not really a, a, a terribly active social media uh, user. However, uh, you guys, you guys at ZTM have sort of sparked my interest in YouTube. So I am, uh, I'm kicking around the idea of doing a little bit more with that, because uh, that, that definitely great. looks fun. And you know, I, I see stuff that you're doing, I'm like, wow, that looks, that looks not, it's not going to look as good as the stuff you do, but um, it's, you know, it, it's inspiring. It's like, wow, this, this, this looks, this looks fun and interesting. And YouTube is kind of a platform where you can do more educational type stuff. Mm. So uh, maybe look out for that. It's at some point in the the fairly near future. But for now, you know, LinkedIn would be would be the place. I check it. Yep. Check it from time to time. Perfect, perfect, man. And uh, if if you ever do create that, uh, or if you start uploading uh, content, educational content, please uh, let me know because I will definitely put that in the description for people to find it um, once that goes live. That will be super fun. I'd love to see that. Uh, I will maybe do. I'll learn a lot. I'll, I'll learn a lot just from uh, just from watching those videos. Not have to take your full course. I might. You know what? You have me so interested though in uh, in kind of diving into some of these um, these uh, data data tools, data solution tools. Especially, I think the one that really interests me is um, the Power BI. Though I don't know if like just because Power BI seems so intensive, 
but I don't know if uh, if I need to go through the the entire phases to get to Power BI. No, you you can actually learn Power BI. It, I would say it's somewhat unusual to 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 learn Power BI without kind of learning Excel first, but you absolutely can. And if anything, it's probably easier because Excel has got just so much stuff for so many different types of people. Whereas yeah. Power BI is more of a purpose built tool. It's specifically for kind of like analytics and dashboards. Whereas Excel is for financial modeling and scientific modeling and it's kind of its own little database if you want it to be and in yeah. addition to being an analytical tool and a reporting tool and a charting engine and all this other stuff whereas power bi kind of like what it is you know so in that sense i think that would be yeah a great place to start i mean i won't lie to you the uh the projects that you created on that that we spoke about before just have me really interested <laughs> i i got i gotta do this myself so i'll love i'll definitely let you know how that goes man but um all in all i really do appreciate you finding the time to come on here man i learned so much i know that our viewers definitely did and uh just on behalf of everyone thank you for creating the courses that you do and um just yep. thanks for sitting down with me man i really appreciate it i, I, I appreciate the, the opportunity to do this it was a lot of fun thank you 